season five and six, everybody. Can I show you guys something really quick before we begin? <gasps> Look at her. If I could, I would literally do this video in the dark just so she could have her moment. Season five and six. What's new, you may ask? Well, first of all, the budget is increasing in Game of Thrones and so is our budget. Now I have the books. I'm on a Clash of Kings right now. Hopefully I will have like more insight. I still have these three books to go. So obviously, maybe not. Let's just jump right into the video and the basis of what we're doing. In this video, I am going to be ranking and reviewing every single episode from seasons five and six to add on to the very vast and grand tier list I have already made with seasons one through four. Of course, there will be spoilers ahead. There's also lots of violence, nudity, crazy shit. Obviously, proceed with caution. But yeah, season five and six. The books available to adapt have been cut down to to just two. A Feast for Crows and A Dance with Dragons. Which, by the way, definitely recommend you all try and read the book series. It's so good so far. If you love Game of Thrones, you'll really love these books as well. To this day, George R.R. R. Martin has yet to finish the series. The producers of the show and D&D specifically decided to make a very, very bold and very controversial move to condense season five into two books, leaving season six with no other books to adapt. Knowing just how thick these books are, this admittedly was not a very good decision, which we'll get into for sure. With questionable decisions underway, there are also some positives to look at. Viewerships go up a lot, and then there's also a massive increase in the budget. In short, it'll be a very drastic roller coaster ride of quality. Let's quickly look over the current tier list standings and all the episodes I've ranked in the past. I gotta do something controversial again, or maybe not controversial, but I gotta change something because I've been thinking about it. Truthfully, episode one deserves Ned's honor. You know, it's the first one. It's too good to be a meh. It just felt wrong having it be so low. Let me give you a recap of the tiers really quickly once again. Bottom is your McQueen, of course. Poopy, poopy, poopy. Shame, shame, shame is below average. Maybe not poopy, but pissy, pissy, pissy. Brian the Three-Eyed Raven is middle of the road, average meh. Nez Honor is good. Has a few faults. Pod's Magic Rod. Right below, perfect. It's basically basically the great tier. A wedding party at the phrase is of course god tier perfection. Every episode here is like perfect to me pretty much. And yeah, so those are the tier names. Here's the episodes I ranked as is. Yeah, see where your faves are. Robin, Catelyn, and the Starks are dead. Tywin is dead and Cersei has taken over. Oberyn Martell is dead and Dorne is upset. Joffrey is dead and Tommen is king. Jojen is dead and Bran is learning Three-Eyed Raven stuff. Everyone at the Wall and beyond is dead and Jon and Stannis are buddies. The Boltons are in Winterfell and Danny's dragons are locked up. Tyrion and Varys ran away and Arya is somewhere. And Sansa is with Littlefinger. There's a new order of how things are working, and we will be jumping into that. As always, though, your support is always very much appreciated. Subscriptions and likes and comments and shares are very much appreciated. I hope you all enjoyed this video. Obviously, my opinions are not straight, solid facts. These are solely just my opinions of the episodes and what I think of them and what I like about them, what I hate about them. Nothing else to say, really. Just sit back and relax and let's talk shit about seasons five and six. Excited. I think I'm excited to like finally start being negative. So the wars to come.
was pretty average. I unfortunately believe that this will be a common occurrence with the first few episodes this season. I could be wrong though. There really was just not a lot of energy coming from the subplots in this episode. Really without the Night's Watch and Stannis together, this would have been a pretty boring one for me. So let's get into it. Oh, f you. Oh my god. I'm not even exaggerating when I say this is quite literally John. Jon Snow's season. D&D could have locked up the rest of the characters in a vault and just let the entire season be solely about Jon Snow. And I'd be like, valid. Especially with this premiere episode, you've got Stannis the Manus and Jon Snow coming together to create an ultimate distance acquaintances sleigh moment. Stannis is hungry for the North and needs the men to take Winterfell from the Boltons and incites the help of Jon Snow to get Mance Radar to bend the knee, which would break the long-lasting tradition of the Free Folk being separate from the Seven Kingdoms. This brings me to my favorite part of the episode, the end. John and Mance together in a room is just pure bliss for me. Great dialogue as John attempts to persuade Mance to bend the knee and save himself and his people who are now stuck north of the wall. Yet Mance resists and chooses death. Holy shit is this scene just amazing. Oh, this is really good. Okay. Everyone's reaction is so... Period. I mean... <laughs> Everything else was pretty lackluster. I will say I'm very excited to see Cersei take front and center stage here with the death of Tywin Lannister. We also need to talk about the great opening to this episode. Cersei's prophecy, which will essentially serve as the guide for Cersei's actions this season. In short, her children are gonna die and a younger, more beautiful queen will take over her position. She obviously thinks it's referring to Marjorie, but I don't know about that. Lancel Lannister makes a comeback, taking part in the highly religious group named the Sparrows, who have risen in influence with Tywin's death. Marjorie walks in on Loras and Oliver the Squire mid makeout sesh, and Cersei is upset with Jaime for letting Tyrion go. And speaking of Tyrion. <laughs> This is the beginning of the downfall of Tyrion's character. You can tell in just a few dialogue scenes between him and Varys, the two most intelligent men in Westeros, that the writing is already floundering for the both of them. Never would Varys have ever uttered the words crate back in the first four seasons. But beyond the point, Varys and Tyrion are in Pentos and Varys gets Tyrion to help Daenerys rise in power. Which which, you know what? I will give them the slay points for that. Oh, Marine, Marine, Marine. This is when the Sons of the Harpy are introduced, and I swear to God, I have never hated a villainous group of people for sucking so bad like this before. They are rebelling against Daenerys' claim in Marine, and they are so overpowered, it's absolutely ridiculous. Daenerys' struggle with her confidence is pretty interesting as she doubts her title of Mother of Dragons dragons since one dragon is gone while the other two are locked up and she kind of just sucks <laughs> at ruling. Overall this first episode was very weak and a very weak introduction to the season as a whole. However if D&D takes my offer of having this be a Night's Watch season only then this could easily be a top tier episode. The war is to come. I thought this was like pretty average for the most part so I'm gonna put it in front of Breaker of chains. The House of Black was actually kind of good to me. It's ironic because apart from the Lord Commander election and Arya's arrival at Bravos, nothing really significant happens to the overall story here. Times, whenever Bravo stood in danger, so there's this play. The Ew. <laughs> yes, yes, Arya's Bravosi adventure begins at the House of Black and White. 
Well, it sort of begins. <laughs> she attempts to gain access, but is pushed away. I have to say though, I did really enjoy finally being able to see the inner city and just how lively Bravos is. Jockin does reveal himself randomly near the end of the episode though, and now Arya's training as a faceless man begins. Brianna Potter kind of letting me down so far. While I thought it was interesting to see Brianna attempt and ultimately fail once again to gain the trust of another Stark daughter and also get a glimpse into Sansa's immense confidence boost. I thought the chase scene between the Knights of the Veil vale and Pod and Brienne was a bit silly and unnecessary, but seeing Brienne in action was pretty cool, I cannot lie. Cersei and Jaime get a threat from Dorne regarding their daughter Marcella, and after Cersei continuously gaslights and berates Jaime, Our only daughter shipped off to Dorne. Our baby boy is set to marry that smirking whore from Highgarden. <laughs> <laughs> Jamie promises to go and free Marcella from Dorne with help from Braun. And so the Jamie and Braun Slayage reunion is back in full swing. And speaking of Cersei, she is exercising her newfound power to the max already. Ward is everyone f***ed. She basically names herself Hand of the King, gives everyone in the King's Council new roles that pisses them off, except for Mace Tyrell, of course. She has also put a very large bounty on Tyrion, which forces Tyrion and Varys to travel as secretively as possible. There's actually one fairly decent conversation between the two of them, discussing power and how they basically have none of it. Storm comes into the picture, and while I think it looks absolutely beautiful, I could definitely do without the plot. Ilaria Sand and most of Dorne want vengeance for Oberyn, but the current Prince of Dorne, Doran, isn't doing shit, and this makes Ilaria super super upset about it. Ugh. I actually kind of liked Daenerys and her subplot this episode. She's doing a really bad job of ruling at the moment. The Unsullied and Dario were able to hold a member of the Sons of the Harpy as a captive, and there was a really interesting debate with Daenerys and her advisors on what to do with him. While Barristan urged her to take a just approach and hold a trial for him, one of her other advisors, who was once a former slave, urged her to murder him for justice. Daenerys listens to Barristan though, but her former slave advisor takes matters into his own hands. Shit gets really crazy here. Damn, she is really not doing a good job. So she publicly sentences the advisor to death, which really just does nothing to help resolve the major split between the nobles versus the lower class. And it only makes Danny even more disliked here. Oh, also, Drogon comes to say hello. The Night's Watch here is just great. More great John and Stannis conversations. He even offers to name John an official Stark, which kind of shook me, I can't lie. This all leads up to a very intense election for a new Lord Commander, which results in a tie between John and Sir Alistair Thorne, who reprimands John for being sympathetic towards the Wildlings. Until... Just such a great scene all throughout. From Sam volunteering John, Mr. Eamon casting the final vote. I'm just very happy and kind of proud of John and seeing how far he's come since season one. The House of Black and White was a good episode, better than its predecessor for sure. I just need some fire sooner or later, otherwise I'm gonna get bored. The House of Black and White, it was good at some points. It was better than the first episode for me. I'm going going to put it right behind the pointy end and in front of Lord Snow. There is a lot to enjoy, and there is also a lot to really not enjoy with High Sparrow. Getting the not so great moments with High Sparrow out of the way, Arya begins sweeping floors in the House of Black and White. I will say though, the House of Black and White truly has one of the best set designs. It really makes up for the lackluster subplot. Overall, the training to become a faceless man is just very confusing to me and boring. There is really just nothing to explain at the moment. Arya gets beat the f up though, which was really funny. No one. Ow! Cunt! Lie. <laughs> 
Oh my god, that was kind of funny. One really impactful scene has to be when Arya gives up her things to become no one. All except for Needle, which was just really touching. I completely hate, hate, hate the Sansa and Bolton meetup that happens here. This is truly one of the full-on first ever blunders that D&D &D make with the show. Basically, Littlefinger gives up Sansa to the Boltons and has her marry Ramsay. This literally makes absolutely zero sense for his character and his motives. It's just very messy for Littlefinger. And such an outlandish move for someone who operates so silently behind the scenes, it literally already begins to slightly falter too since Ruth Bolton already questions Littlefinger's actions. The alliance also makes no sense for the Boltons whatsoever who want to betray their alliance with the Lannisters. They use Tywin's death as reasoning but it still hardly benefits them to betray such a powerful family especially when their standing with the North is as fragile as it is. This entire subplot is just not very good. I will commend Sophie Turner's acting here though. Brian and Podrick are still following closely by and they have a nice little bonding moment together which reminded me a lot of how much I actually do truly love Brianne. Castle Black and King's Landing are by far the two best parts of this episode. With Castle Black, Jon rejects Stannis' offer of an alliance to take back Winterfell and to officially name him Jon Stark which kind of sucks because how cool would that have been? We also get a first glimpse into Jon's leading skills as Lord Commander, and he actually does a pretty fantastic job off the bat, being very mindful, respectful, dare I say wise as well. Jon O'Slint aka Baldy tries him though and refuses one of his orders, which results in a fantastic beheading scene. This is how you do it. That's all you gotta do. Period. And you know what? It's about time. Marjorie and Tommen's wedding is great, though the age gap is madness. Their bedding scene is hilarious. This is what I want to do all day, every day, for the rest of my life. Oh my that god, <laughs> no. And the fact he doesn't even know the name still. Marjorie pushes Cersei's buttons. Cersei sends a letter beckoning for Littlefinger to return back to King's Landing, which he somehow gets the letter in the next scene. Anyways, the High Septon gets punished for his weird kink by the Sparrows, and our first ever Walk of Atonement of the season happens! Yay! He wants Cersei to arrest the Sparrows and to execute the High Sparrow, who serves as a bit of a leader for them. We'll get to him more later. <laughs> King's Landing is pretty great here, though. The episode ends with Varys continuously warning Tyrion not to wander, then Tyrion wandering around Volantis and promptly getting caught by Jorah. This episode was either pretty good or pretty not good. Peter Baelish, Tyrion, and even Arya's storyline takes a hit. However, the absolute domination of Jon Snow and Castle Black is extremely prevalent here. And I also thoroughly enjoy seeing Cersei up King's Landing. I hate that they put Sansa and Littlefinger's photo here. I did enjoy this episode regardless, so I will put this in Ned's honor as well. Behind Pine Garden of Bones. Okay, now we're getting to the point where this show is gonna start pissing me off. Let me take a moment. <sighs> All right. We'll start off with the things I tolerated, even enjoyed at some parts. I think Tyrion and Jon's convers- oh, I think Jorah and Tyrion's conversations as they head over to Daenerys is a lot of fun. I also absolutely loved Stannis and Shireen here, where Stannis validates Shireen and very openly loves her. You are the Princess Shireen of House Baratheon. And you are my daughter. Oh. John rejecting Melisandre's advances onto him out of love for Egret is also very well done when you don't think about what happens in season 7 and 8. But the standout for me here is once again King's Landing. I actually thoroughly enjoyed it a lot. Cersei sends Mace Tyrell and Sir Marin to Bravos in order to negotiate with the Iron Bank, which we will get back to. She then further f***s up her power trip when she gives the Sparrows even more power and influence 
influence by providing them with weapons now, which becomes an absolute shit show. Oh. This ends up leading to the arrest of Loris for being a gay boy. Gay boy. Which was Cersei's primary intention. This obviously pisses off Marjorie, who yells at Tommen to fuck up and free Loris. I actually feel so bad for Tommen though. Tommen fails and Marjorie wants nothing to do with him or his family. Overall, King's Landing was great. Now let's get down to the not so great to just straight up stupid of the episode. Jamie and Braun arrive in Dorne. And while I do love them together, my god, is this plot just yikes. They get into a fight with some Dornishmen, and Jamie's plot armor really just begins to make its debut here. <laughs> Be so serious right now. Then on the flip side, the Stand Snakes are introduced, and my god, are they going to be annoying. They want vengeance for Oberyn as well. Littlefinger prepares to leave Sansa and Winterfell, and while I love the backstory behind Rhaegar's advances onto Lyanna Stark, him explaining his reasoning for allying with the Boltons is absolutely stupid as <laughs> Nothing compares to the monstrosity. That is the end of this episode. I do really love hearing about Rhaegar from Sir Barristan's point of view before things just go to shit. The sons of the Harpy are at it again. I don't know what the hell happened to the Unsullied that made them suck so bad at fighting, but they get taken down so easily by these rebels with little to no experience. Then to really hammer in the final nail of this episode's coffin, Sir Barristan and Grey Worm are bested by the sons of the Harpy, even resulting in the death of Sir Barristan? You mean to tell me that this man, who has been built up to be one of, if not the greatest warriors in Westeros, is killed in a random alley by a few rebels with knives and shit? How? For me, I openly think that Sir Barriss' death is really the beginning of the slow descent of the show's quality. The unceremonious killing of a pretty important and lovable character for virtually no reason. Basically based off of Game of Thrones' logic, Barriss would have completely ended the untrained Sons of the Harpy in that stupid ass alleyway. Does it make sense? and I'm gonna get pissed, so let's move on and end this episode here. This is a very half and half episode for me. Yes, I hated a good chunk of it, especially the ending, but I also did enjoy quite a bit of it. King's Landing saves Sons of the Harpy for me. The Sons of the Harpy cannot get over Sir Barrison's death, but I mean, apart from that, things are okay. It's going in Brand the Three-Eyed Raven. fine, I guess. The thing is, literally nothing happened apart from the Night's Watch and the ending scene. This could have just been a Night's Watch central episode, and it would have had the same amount of action and importance as the normal full-length episode. There are a few important moments here and there. Sir Barrison is dead and Daenerys is fuming. She rallies up all the heads of the noble houses, thinking that one of them has something to do with the Sons of the Harpy, and they even feeds one of them to her damn dragons, which... <laughs> <laughs> Apart from that, Grey Worm loves Masande, which was sweet, and Masande even counsels Daenerys a bit here on how to handle the current political state of Marine. And it's a pretty great moment, actually, and it only instills more confidence in Daenerys. So she decides to reopen the pits and marry the nobleman guy that we've been seeing a lot of to appease her people and the surrounding cities. It's a bit of a slay, I will admit. Winterfell takes up a surprising amount of time here, and it definitely has way too much time. Everything definitely dragged on here. It's literally just a lot of Sansa settling into the Boltonized Winterfell. Bruce and Waldefrey are pregnant, and then just outside Winterfell, Brienne sends a message to Sansa. If she ever needs help, light a candle outside a window in a tower. Just a lot of filler, to be honest, apart from the Theon and Sansa moments. Everything at Castle Black here is just so great. Starting with this absolutely fantastic moment, it's a galleon alone in the world. It's a terrible thing.
It's just, it's so amazing. And the power in his voice when he says, kill, kill the, the boy, boy, it's good. Turns out Jon Snow wants to reunite the crows and the wildlings here in order to expand their army and to protect more civilians against the impending White Walker army invasion. And boy, oh boy, is this shit controversial. And he barely gets any support on his plans. The one place he's able to get support from is with Tormund, and this conversation is so good as well. They will be heading off shortly to a town called Hardhome, where a majority of the free folk north of the wall are taking refuge. Stannis also further proves his prowess as a grammar icon. Less enemies for us. Few. What? <laughs> And he sets off to Winterfell without any aid from the Night's Watch. Also, there was a nice little Sam and Gilly moment which was needed. The ending is actually pretty great. Tyrion's downfall isn't in full swing yet, but plot armor definitely has made an appearance here. Tyrion and Jorah ride through Old Valyria, which actually looks amazing to be honest. Drogon randomly flies over them, and I really do love Tyrion's pure reaction to seeing a dragon for the first time. The good vibes end though once they get attacked by stone men and somehow they make it out, but they make it out nearly unharmed. Nearly unharmed. Oh shit. Oh shit. Oh no, no, no. Honestly, what a great plot twist to end the episode on. Pretty great stuff. This episode was pretty much fine. I was sort of surprised that not a lot of subplots were present here. Yet again, the Night's Watch carried. Winterfell dragged on. Marine was actually fine. And Tyrion and Jorah kind of ate here. Solid stuff. Kill the boy. Actually kind of enjoyed. So kill the boy is going to go in between House of Black and white and the pointy end. Okay. I need a f***ing drink. I wasn't expecting shit to get this bad early on in the show. It's still season 5. I know unbowed, unbent, unbroken was just so f***ing boring. It legitimately had no reason to exist apart from the arrests of Loris and Marjorie. Maybe even Sansa's wedding, which even then shouldn't even be a f***ing thing in the first place. You guys, the Arya and Faceless Man subplot, oh my f***ing word. It contributed nothing to this episode. It's so boring. It makes no goddamn sense. We see the Hall of Faces, which is fine, but let's move on from that. Jorah and Tyrion are fine. The talk about both of their dad's respective deaths was an interesting development in their relationship. Their capture by pirates was also pretty passable. And Tyrion gets to use his wits one last time. Jaime and Bronn are at Dorne and meet up with Marcella, who is actually really in love with the Prince Tristain and also really loves Dorne in general. And then the Sand Snakes fight them and... Uh, Lord, what the hell is this shit? They're all captured though. That ends pretty quickly. King's Landing is... Oh, you can smell the shit from five miles away. Damn, she is so real. Elena Tyrell is really the major redeeming quality with this episode. Her throwdown with Cersei is just simply iconic, and it really shines a light on the stupid decisions Cersei has been making recently, especially regarding her alliance with the Tyrell family. Other than that, Littlefinger is back to stir up some shit and ask Cersei for Winterfell while throwing Sansa and the Boltons under the bus. Loras has a quick hearing which has a rather unnerving lack of logic present to be honest. They bring in Oliver the Squire to testify against Loras to prove that Loras is a homo big fat no-no. And he uses the birthmark on Loras's upper thigh as justifiable evidence that Loras is in fact sleeping with men. But the thing is... He is a squire. Of course he's going to see the entire naked body of the knight that he is serving. Point being, this evidence doesn't mean shit. If I talk about this anymore, I'm going to pop a blood vessel. So this entire scene is just ludicrous and really upsetting. And then Marjorie also gets arrested for lying under the seven and... 
and whatever. The ending is really just the cherry on top of a pretty abysmal episode as is. Sansa and Ramsay get married. One moment I did like, I will say, is Sansa clocking the psychotic girlfriend. Seriously, f*** her. She needs to be humbled. Everything else sucks though. The wedding ceremony was awkward and just sad. Sophie Turner looks gorgeous here though. Then we have the pretty disgusting and distasteful ending. This scene was just so unnecessary though. We already hate Ramsay. We get it. And Sansa has been through enough already. Like seriously, enough is a f enough. So yeah, I can confidently say that this is the first ever truthfully bad episode of Game of Thrones. I did not like a single thing about this episode. There were maybe like one or two redeeming moments, but other than that, the subplots were just awful here. Just very boring, dragged on, distasteful, lacked good writing, the list goes on. I've already aired my grievances with this one, but Unbowed, Unbent, Unbroken is awful. For the first time, we have have a Yoma Queen. Round of applause! Okay. I, I need this next episode to save us. The gift was a pretty middle of the road episode, all right. I think it was just a whole lot of buildup for the final three episodes to come. So there wasn't really a whole lot of fun or excitement to be had here, apart from the end. The Night's Watch is good per usual, as Jon Snow heads off to Hard Home with Tormund and a few other watchers. The stank faces on all the other watchmen though, they are definitely not not happy with Jon Snow here. The Sam and Jon goodbye was very bittersweet. Mr. Eamon's death is just tragically beautiful. And I've got to say the composition that plays throughout is just chef's kiss. The music has always been amazing through and through with the show though, let's be real. Sam stands up for Gilly despite getting his ass beat. Ooh. And it's just really sweet. And then they fuck. He has become such a king lately. Everything else for the most part is pretty meh and slow for me. Ramsay is treating Sansa horribly and Sansa tries getting help from Theon, which is a pretty great scene though, but he does end up betraying her. Stannis' army is struggling in the snow. Davos urges them to wait it out at Castle Black, but Stannis wants to push onwards. Using the snow as an obstacle against Stannis' army is kind of lazy writing though to me. In a great scene, Melisandre tries getting Stannis to sacrifice Shireen and turn the odds of war in his favor, which he greatly refuses though. Jorah and Tyrion are sold off to a slave master who takes them to Marine to fight in the piss for Daenerys. Tyrion beats up some guy. The reunion is obviously very awkward though and tense. Probably could have done this any other way. Dorne is exactly what you think it is. Jamie and Marcella's short yet effective conversation is pretty good. Bronn and the Sand Snakes are unbearably cringy. That's about it from Dorne. King's Landing is kind of the big plot line of this episode. It's a mixed bag for the most part though. Like, Olena has one really great conversation with the High Sparrow, but then has a pretty unnecessary and questionable conversation with Littlefinger. Then we have a fantastic moment with Tommen and Cersei. Tommen is very depressed with Marjorie being prisoned, and even though Cersei is the main reason behind this, she still does make an attempt to comfort and advise her son. And you know what? Seeing Cersei love Tommen as much as she does is pretty f***ing lovely, okay? To me, that being said, Cersei doesn't do anything that she promises she'll do to Tommen. She literally just torments Marjorie like like a toddler. My son needs me now more than ever. Get out, you hateful bitch! Oh, she is mad. And then feeling all smug and shit, she visits the High Sparrow. It's just very clear he's not buying into any of the bullshit she continuously spits out. And then things take a bit of a turn. What will we find when we strip away your finery? Let me go immediately. You I'm so sorry, you know. but this goes so hard. I love seeing her smug little face change into an 
Oh, f and then, of course, the it'll be the last thing you see before you die line is just chills. Lena Headey, she does a phenomenal job as Cersei here, especially. I love this scene, and we will all collectively ignore the cheesy ass reveal of Lancel and call it a day. So, like I said, the gift was pretty middle of the road for me. As much as I love Cersei's imprisonment and then the Castle Black stuff, nothing really stands out here for me. Episode seven, The Gift. Very mediocre for the most part. I'll put this at the front of Random Three-Eyed Raven. I think an episode like this deserves to be seen on a bigger screen. Hard Home, y'all. Hard Home by far has the biggest imbalance of quality. Like the first 30 minutes is fine. But it seems like so much of it just drags on for such an unnecessary amount of time. And then you have those final 30 minutes at Hard Home, which is arguably at least a top five moment across the entire show. But there were some moments for sure that stood out to me in a positive light. Cersei being imprisoned is great for me. Lena Headey carries as Cersei and captures her hidden rage so well. In short, Cersei has just fallen really hard here from where she was at the beginning of the season. What an absolute like tumble. I do love when Tyrion and Daenerys talk about the great political wheel of houses in Westeros. And then Daenerys says this super iconic ass line. I'm not going to stop the wheel. I'm going to break the wheel. <laughs> oh. It really is a great moment for Danny and shows just how far she's grown in this season. Other than that, Jorah is just sent right back out of Marine. And then Jorah comes right back to Marine to fight in the fighting pits. Arya finally has some shit happening to her. She gets a mission to poison an old man, but then that's pretty much it. So once again, nothing really happens. Sansa and Theon are actually pretty great here. Both Sophie and Alfie Allen do a fantastic acting job in this confrontation scene where Theon admits to not killing Bran and Rickon and even admits to feeling guilty about what he did to the Stark family. Sam and Ollie have a quick moment, which was all right. And then finally, we get to Hard Home. This is literally one of, if not my favorite plot in the entire show. It is so incredible. I completely understand why people say Hard Home is like their all time favorite. Everything about John's visit to Hard Home is just made to complete perfection. The impalpable tension when the crows and Tormund first land, Tormund beating some guy's ass the hell up, the meeting where John and Tormund have to influence influence a bunch of wildling leaders to join the Night's Watch to fight against the dead. Which, by the way, Jon Snow is a fantastic spokesperson and motivational speaker here. The Free Folk can't stop them, the Night's Watch can't stop them, and all the Southern Kings can't stop them. And even then it may not be enough, but at least we'll give the fuckers a fight. That's my man. That's my man. Like, shit, I'd fight dead people for him too. I also want to commend Kit Harrington here. He's really just brought so much justice to Jon Snow's character. I have to give him his tens. The wildlings end up agreeing with the Alliance plans, and they begin evacuating people on Stannis' ships. Until... Oh my god, they are so I love it. Things just go into an absolute whirlwind of chaos and wow. The camera work is insane. The White Walkers are horrifying. The sense of dread and panic you cannot miss. And the music. This scene in general is just 15 minutes of pure chaos. And I love it. And then Jon Snow is just a f***ing G here, point blank. Oh, shit. <laughs> 
Oh my god, John. No! The Watchmen and Wildlings barely make it out alive, though. And I mean, barely. And then that final scene. Chills. So while the first 30 minutes were a bit slow for me at some points, I can't not give this episode the recognition and the flowers it deserves. Hard Home was magnificent, truly. So brilliant, so chilling, so, so good. Hard Home. I know that there's imperfections with this episode, but those last 30 minutes completely make up for it. Jon Snow has been the G this season. It's gonna go in Pod's Magic Rod. I'll be honest, I didn't really like episode 9. I know, the ending, the damn ending. Yes, it's iconic, okay? It's very memorable. But everything else was just so boring or a complete and utter train wreck for me. I just, I didn't vibe with this episode at all. John returning the castle black with the wildlings is pretty cool. Seeing such a historic moment occur with wildlings entering through the castle black gates was pretty great, not gonna lie. Dorn is the usual, pretty dull and bland here. Prince Dorian pardons Jamie and Braun and allows Prince Tristane and Marcella to go back to King's Landing with them. Alaria Sand is obviously pissed off, but Dorian checks her. It's supposed to be a really emotional moment, but frankly, I could have cared less. I will say, Jamie and Alaria bonding over their unconventional love interests was pretty interesting. Arya in Bravos is. Well, Arya and Bravos. She decides to ditch her original mission once she sees Mace Tyrell and Sir Marin Trant. For context, Marin Trant is a name on Arya's kill list, so obviously her sights are set on him now. He also turns out to be a p so that makes us hate him even more. The biggest insult to this episode for me though, and to the show in general, has to be the complete obliteration of Stannis' character in just one episode. Oh my god, is his subplot handled horribly. His camp gets attacked by Bolton men in the night, who set their camp on fire, making conditions even worse for them, and then supplies and men even fewer. Personally, I think this is all pretty lazy writing just to even out the odds between Stannis' army and the Bolton's army, and to just make Stannis incredibly weak for the next episode. The best moment for sure has to be Davos and Shireen again, where Davos gives her a wooden stag and it's so f***ing adorable! Oh my god! You like it? God, he's such a f***ing sweetheart! The good vibes come to a very abrupt end though when Stannis makes a visit to Shireen, then he makes a very, very questionable, insane decision to sacrifice Shireen to the Lord of Light to better his odds in the battle at Winterfell. Yeah, I cannot. I cannot do this. I cannot handle this right now. Listen, I am all for plot twists. Extremely dark deaths in TV shows especially, but only when it makes sense with the characters involved, and this just makes no sense for Stannis. This whole season, he has been such a great father figure and a very loving dad to Shireen, even defending her against Melisandre, and then suddenly out of nowhere, he's like, okay, let's take out the trash, aka my own daughter. It's just way too out of the blue, way out of character for Stannis here. To be a significant or good twist. It just, it doesn't work. It would have probably worked if Stannis didn't know about it. It sucks. Well, on that happy note, let's talk about Daenerys and Marine. This is admittedly the silver lining this episode greatly needed. Basically, the fighting in the pits begins, and it's fine. Jorah pops up to say hello and to win over Daenerys, which he actually is able to do, surprisingly. Then things take a turn. Oh. oh shit. Sons of the Harpy are back. And they're just massacring and killing everyone in the audience. I mean, this does seem like it's trying to be a bit of another hard home moment. The real highlight, of course, comes from the sky. Oh. Okay, this this kind of eats. 
This part kind of eats. And then she flies out of there with him. And while the CGI looks awful, it looks terrible. It is such a great moment. It is so cool. So yeah, I, I liked the ending a lot. It's very iconic, but I just didn't like this episode overall. I can't look past Shireen's death. The Dance of Dragons, I think this is controversial once again about how I did not like this one, but because of how much I disliked Shireen and Stannis' storyline here, it's going in shame, shame, shame. Well, made it to the end of season five. <sighs> Mother's Mercy serves as the conclusion for basically all the storylines that occurred in this season. For the most part, it doesn't do that bad of a job, actually. Dare I say, it did a very good job. The thing is, though, there are just a really good chunk of unsatisfying conclusions with this episode, which we'll get into. It's a mixed bag once again. So things kick off with the aftermath of Shireen's death. The weather has cleared up, but half of Stannis's men have left. His wife went ahead and k-worded herself. Even Melisandre dips on Stannis in his cause when she realizes that she was wrong. This all just seems so rushed and so wrong for Stannis especially. D&D &D wanted Stannis gone. He does go to conquer Winterfell finally and faces off against the Bolton army which is a lot stronger and a lot bigger. My god is this just such a train wreck. Oh my god. Hold you're telling me he isn't prepared for shit. As the battle is happening, Brienne kind of has a moment where she can either choose between her duty or she can choose between vengeance, which was a really good moment for her, I will say. Brienne ends up choosing vengeance and kills Stannis officially. Sansa is also trying to escape as this is happening, which is a great scene for Theon especially as he helps her escape, killing the psychotic girlfriend. Thank God because the subplot. Getting back to Stannis though, he gets annihilated by the Boltons and he gets the most unceremonious, underwhelming death and defeat throughout the entire show. For a main character especially, while yes, seeing Brienne get vengeance for Renly is great and all, I just really cannot help but feel that Stannis gets completely tossed to the side come the end of season five. If they were gonna kill him off, he deserves so much better. Marin Trant starts abusing little girls before Arya completely wrecks him and gets her first kill with someone from the list. I'll admit, it's a slay. But taking a life that she wasn't assigned to take, she faces the consequences of Jacques and Hagar, who takes her eyesight away. I'm gonna say it. This was a good moment as well. It's a little too late, but Bravo stepped up this episode. Jamie, Marcella, Braun, and Tristane head out of Dorne, but not before a little smooch for Marcella from Alaria. And you want a good girl, but you need a bad pussy. <laughs> Ew. We really could have lived a lifetime without ever hearing that phrase. There is an oddly touching moment with Jamie and Marcella where she accepts the incest between Jamie and Cersei and also accepts Jamie as her father. <laughs> it's sweet, okay? Aww. Incest wins, everyone. Turns out the smooch Alaria gave Marcella actually ended up poisoning her, and so she sadly dies. Cersei's prophecy grows even truer than before. Daenerys' council all discuss what to do with Danny missing and no one to rule over Marine. Jorah and Dario go on a little trip to find her while Tyrion, Masande, and Grey Worm stay in Marine to rule. Also, Varys pops up out of nowhere. Oh. Daenerys is lost with Drogon, who is too grumpy and sleepy to give a single flying f And then she gets swarmed by a random herd of Dothraki. Why go through all this trouble for a random girl frolicking in a field? All right, let's talk about the best moment of season five, point blank. It's Cersei's walk of atonement. So Cersei confesses. She gives in to the High Sparrow, the same man she gave all of this power to, and here she is kneeling at his feet. The downfall doesn't end there. After an incredibly brutal montage of her getting washed and shaved, she must now atone for her sins. And my god, this entire moment is so good. Shame. Shame. <sighs> 
Oh my god. God, is it so... Oh! It's so bad! I mean, seriously, like, how can one even recover from this, you know? Lena Headey does a phenomenal acting job here. I feel bad for her. It's just so humiliating and beyond demeaning. Like, I feel bad for Cersei. I could go on and on about how amazing everything in this scene is, but we'd be here all day. She makes it to the Red Keep, and Maester Kyburn comforts her and shows her his newest creation that he's been working on, a Frankenstein-esque mountain zombie guy whose sole purpose is to kill all of Cersei's enemies, then you start to feel a little less worse for Cersei. And to wrap up the finale, we have Castle Black. Sam and John have such a great, wonderful conversation. Sam does ask John for permission to head south to the Citadel so he can train to be a maester. Honestly, I'm excited to see Maester Sam make his debut. Melisandre arrives back to Castle Black after the devastating Stannis loss at Winterfell. And both Davos and Jon know it isn't for a good reason. But beyond the point, the episode must come to an end now. No, please, no. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> 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 Yeah, what a way to end your f season. Holy shit, is this death chilling. So damn heartbreaking and tragic. It's a great twisted and f ending. But yeah, that's the finale of season five. Quite a lot happens here and quite a lot is finished with the storylines. I think Stannis's demise really brings down the quality of this episode. But to be honest, everything else was either tolerable or just absolutely f fantastic. AKA the Walk of Atonement and Jon's death. Overall, I'm pleased to say that I am more than content with this episode. Finally, we have the finale of season five. Mother's Mercy. I enjoyed this a lot. Obviously, the Walk of Atonement and Jon Snow's death are two of the best moments of the season. I like this enough to put this in Ned's honor, and it'll go right behind, and now his watch has ended. So let's talk about season five, shall we? <laughs> This is really the first time in the entire show that I've had some really negative and rather harsh criticisms to share. At this point, it is really prevalent that the quality is really taking a turn here for Game of Thrones. In fact, a lot of the storylines here are actually original plots made up by D&D and were not taken directly from the novels. The Dorne adventures with Jamie and Braun, for example, Sansa with the Boltons and Winterfell, just beyond on that as well. What they did to most of these characters, like Stannis, it was really hard to watch unfold. Arya becomes incredibly bland here, and her subplot in Bravos is so boring. Marine honestly gets a bad rap this season. It wasn't great or anything, and it was pretty boring at times and really directionless, but seeing Daenerys grow more confident though was really, really nice to see. There were a very good handful of things I enjoyed about about season five as well. For one thing, I may be alone in this, but I actually enjoyed King's Landing for the most part this season, especially with the first few episodes and the incredible conclusion that occurs. Loris's hearing is poorly written, yes, but I mean, Cersei's downfall is a phenomenal thing to witness. I will also be the first to admit that Tyrion was not a bad character at all here. Yes, I do wish there was more change and development that occurred in his character, but I I truly still enjoyed him for the most part, but by far the absolute standout is Jon Snow in The Night's Watch. Jon is fantastic here. Kit Harington did a splendid 
job. And you know what? Sam was great too. Nothing bad at all to say about Castle Black, to be honest. Overall, season five was a fairly mediocre season. I think it needed more completeness. The writing needed to be a lot more refined. And honestly, what's the point of getting rid of Bran here? Anyways, here's where we're at so far with season five. There it is in all its glory. One thing is for certain though, season six will have a lot of pieces to pick up with no more books to adapt. How will D&D &D approach season six and the storylines needed to be told here? Well, it's time to find out. So we've made it to season six. Let's get into it. Y'all, episode one of season six started off so strong for me. And then things really began to falter a bit towards the end. Starting with the positives and everything that occurred within the first half of the episode, we just jump right into the aftermath of Jon Snow's death, which was really interesting and really well done. A group of Jon's most loyal friends, including Ed, Ghost, and and uh, Sir Davos. Uh, yeah, anyways, they take his body into a locked room, anticipating a revolt against Alistair Thorne, who bluntly admits to killing Jon Snow with no repercussions or consequences whatsoever. It does hype you up for the next upcoming episodes. Ramsay feeds the body of his psycho girlfriend to his hounds. Sansa and Theon cross a super duper cold river and are promptly caught until Brienne literally comes out of nowhere and wrecks everyone there, saving Sansa and Theon. And finally, after two seasons, a Stark girl accepts Brienne's loyalty and protection. I pledge to ask no service of you that might bring you dishonor. You know what? I swear it's the old Period. Period. And I do love Theon's redemption coming into fruition. The best moment of the episode is without a doubt Jamie's arrival back to King's Landing with Marcella's dead body. It's soul crushing. It really is. Seeing Cersei all excited and happy for once in her life, only for her to realize she has died as well. And yeah, it sucks. Damn. Why do I feel bad for Cersei? It's so brilliantly acted though, and it's insane that I'm sympathizing with Cersei of all people here. But another fantastic conversation occurs between Cersei and Jaime as they mourn the loss of their child. It's really such a beautiful and vulnerable moment for the both of them. I can't believe I'm saying this, but I'm rooting for the Lannisters this season. High Sparrow hints at a potential alliance with Marjorie, and everything else from here on out is just, yeah. Alaria and the Sand Snakes murder Prince Doran and Prince Tristane without consequences or conflict. Tyrion and Varys walk around Marine and start making cock jokes. It's a good thing you're not a boy anymore, because you have no cock. <sighs> oh, Jesus. This season is really where Tyrion's character actually begins to falter. And to make the writing even more intolerable with Maureen, some guys burn a whole ass fleet of ships without anyone noticing. Jorah and Dario find the place where Daenerys was taken. Jorah's grayscale is getting worse. This is a fine scene. Daenerys is a slave in another Dothraki horde. And while it's cool to be back with the Dothraki, again, it does suck to see Daenerys go back to rock bottom. She reveals herself as a former Khaleesi, though, with the call. He just throws her in with the other widowed Khaleesi's. I mean, it's all fine. Kind of frustrating to be back there. Arya is living on the streets, still blind as hell, and the apprentice girl, whoever the f*** she is, just starts beating the hell out of her, and nobody 
gives a f that is happening. The ending is really unnecessary and doesn't do remotely anything to affect or change the story in any way. Apparently the necklace Melisandre wears makes her much younger than she really is, but there's so many inconsistencies since she isn't always wearing the necklace in the show. It's a shame this was such a mixed bag of an episode because honestly there was a lot to really enjoy here. Cersei and Jaime are the major standouts. Everything else was just a bit not super good. Alrighty, season six, starting with episode one. I think the first half was good enough to warrant it a Ned's honor. Home is uh, fine. This was a pretty major filler episode, but oddly enough, I kind of enjoyed most of the moments here. Bran is indeed back. Oh. Oh, Bran is back. Nothing important happens, but we do get some cute clips of a young Ned Stark with his siblings and even a young Hodor, which was cool. Alistair Thorne is about to completely wreck Jon's supporters until Ed comes back with the wildlings and does a 360 wreckage lay on Alistair and his men. The mountain shoves someone and Cersei is stopped from going to Marcella's funeral by Tommen of all people. Tommen does visit Cersei though, and they do make up kudos to Tommen's actor because his interaction with Cersei especially was pretty emotional. The masters have retaken Yonkai and Astapor apparently, and Tyrion's intelligence continues to deteriorate as he unchains Daenerys' dragons. Somehow, he's able to do it. Marine. Arya continues to get her shit rocked. They don't even you give don't a either. single f They're just like, okay. And Jockin decides to randomly take her back for some reason. Jesus. Surprisingly, Ramsay's subplot is actually one of the highlights of the episode. After the birth of Walda's son, Ramsay decides to kill off Roos and officially claim himself as Warden of the North and head of House Bolton. He also feeds Walda and his newborn baby to his hounds, which is so so beyond f but damn, is Ramsay a fantastic and extremely hateable villain. Theon leaves Sansa with Brienne and Podrick. This was also a very enjoyable scene for me. It was just surprisingly really emotional seeing Sansa and Theon say goodbye to each other. But then he heads off to Pike. And speaking of which, the Greyjoy seem to be struggling as Yara and Balon argue over some shit. But then Balon randomly runs into his long lost brother Euron, aka Theon and Yara's uncle. Let's just say this is probably his best moment throughout all three seasons he's appearing in. He shoves Balon off a bridge and I've gotta give credit where credit is due. The set is magnificent. With Balon dead though, there must be a vote for the next head of House Greyjoy. And then finally we end it all at Castle Black where Davos is for some reason reason desperate to revive and save Jon Snow despite barely knowing him. He gets Melisandre, who is incredibly defeated after Stannis' defeat, to use the Lord of Light's magic in order to bring Jon back to life. Similar to way back in season 3, it doesn't seem to work at first. <gasps> Jon Snow is in fact our second revival of the show. A lot of people call this kind of cheap to have this shocking ending back in season 5, only to revive Jon Snow three episodes later, and then not even have him change his character or anything about him. To me, it is very lazy, I agree, but I also don't mind it considering how big of a character Jon is in the later seasons anyways, and how big of a role he plays. So yeah, yeah, that's episode two. I honestly thought it was all right. It was slow and heavy on the dialogue, yes. But you know what? I think it did a solid enough job and I did enjoy it at some points. Episode two, home. We're gonna put it one step ahead of the Red Woman. 
So, looking at the description of this Don't episode pee. alone, I really did not have high expectations for Oathbreaker. But through it all, it was fine, but just really boring, which is surprising, considering we get quite a few action sequences here. But the thing is, there really is not a lot of story progression going on. We just get stuck going nowhere with Oathbreaker. We make it to Vase Dothrak with Daenerys, which looks pretty cool. Nothing crazy happens here, just Daenerys hanging with the former Khaleesi's. Sam and Gilly are back and they are on a ship headed to Old Town in the south. They will be making a pit stop at Sam's home in Horn Hill so that Gilly and baby Sam can stay there since the Citadel doesn't allow women and children. One of the better parts of the episode is Bran watching a flashback of a younger version of his father Ned fighting one of the best swordsmen in Westeros named Sir Arthur Dane. The choreography here and the sword fighting is phenomenal. Arguably one of the best sword fights of the entire show. Ooh, okay, choreography. This is good. And also the actor looks so so much like Ned, it's actually kind of crazy. Also, there's a subtle hint at time traveling being a thing when young Ned is able to hear Bran. The annoying thing about this is that the Three-Eyed Raven very obviously keeps cock-blocking Bran from seeing anything else. Solely for plot purposes, Varys pumps a Sons of the Harpy accomplice for information and turns out the masters from Astapor and Yunkai are funding them. And then Tyrion steps in and annoys the f out of me by being dumb and completely ignores Masande and Grey Worm, two people who have experienced slavery firsthand and the masters at Slaver's Bay. Basically, Tyrion decides to throw like some kind of tea party with them to compromise a deal. Enough! Enough of Marine, please! Speaking of Varys though, his little birds in King's Landing are now serving under Meister Kyburn. Cersei and Jamie try to crash the King's Small Council, which now consists of their uncle Kevin and Queen of All Slaves, Lady Olena, who all reject them immediately, which, you know what? Fair. Tommen and the High Sparrow have a pretty boring and confusing conversation, but it does seem like Tommen grows more interested in religious practices. Surprisingly, Arya's subplot is not the worst subplot this episode. She's just finally doing some physical training as a faceless man, and it's great. And after proving herself to be fairly skilled, she gets her eyesight back. Honestly, this was not a bad scene for me. Osha and Rickon get captured by Ramsay Bolton for plot purposes. And then the episode begins and ends with Jon Snow at Castle Black. We open the episode with Jon Snow's revival and it's a pretty chilling first few minutes. Then the ending is also pretty good with Jon Snow getting the final upper hand against his killers, including Alistair Thorne and even little Ollie, which is nuts. It's a very, very dark and chilling scene. Damn. And then to top it all off, Jon Snow resigns as Lord Commander, and we almost get some character progression and story with Jon here. Oathkeeper was yet another pretty major filler episode. It wasn't bad, but it certainly wasn't good, and not a lot of story progression happened here, which made it pretty boring and even a little hard to continue watching all the way through. Oathbreaker. It'll go one spot ahead of Sons of the Harpy. Oh my god, this shit is over an hour long. I swear to god. Book of the Stranger was a drastic up and down roller coaster of quality. I will say off the bat, the episode was definitely longer than it needed to be. I feel as though a lot of the subplots here could have easily been added to episodes two and three. Marine here is just excruciating. Probably the most excruciating it's been 
in this season. Tyrion is just an absolute train wreck here. The intelligence and wit that he possessed within the first five seasons has been completely thrown out the window. He wants to compromise with the masters ruling over Slaver's Bay, despite Missande and Grey Worm continuously telling him how shit of an idea it is. Please spare us of any more marine shit before I go into cardiac arrest. Instead of abolishing slavery overnight, we will give you seven years to end the practice. Oh my god. I cannot. I cannot. I am also not a fan of Osha's death scene here. Just way too rushed and uneventful for a pretty major character back in the day. There's also a pretty unnecessary little finger scene where people in the area call him out for making some idiotic ass decisions in season five. And then he encourages Rob and Aaron to help Sansa take back Winterfell and that's about it. King's Landing ranges in quality here. Marjorie meets with the High Sparrow. He allows her to see Loras. Obviously trying to get on her good side. Cersei sort of advises Tommen as well, which is pretty all right. I do love these two actors together a lot, actually. Turns out, however, Marjorie will also have to make a walk of atonement. The King's Council plus Jamie and Cersei make plans to not allow that to happen. But of course, Elena needs to put another jab towards Cersei before anything else. You have been stripped of your dignity and authority publicly shamed and confined to the Red Keep. What's left to work with? <laughs> Why wasn't she in the King's Council this whole time? Fiona arriving back at Pike is actually so good to me. He shares a very harsh and emotional exchange with Yara, then offers his support for her claim to the Iron Islands, and it's all great. A majority of the episode revolves around Castle Black. First of all, Sansa and John reunite. Oh! This is a huge deal, considering the fact that this is the first Stark reunion since they've all been separated way back in season one of episode two. It is a beautiful moment though, truly, and I also like how they're the least connected Starks, just to show how significant a reunion like this is. They do end up having a bit of a back and forth over the state of Winterfell. Jon is understandably tired of having to constantly fight, while Sansa is amped up and ready to take back their home. Brienne randomly tells Davos and Melisandre she killed Stannis. Tormund is also crashing on Brienne. Then Jon Snow gets a pink letter from Ramsay Bolton, basically antagonizing and taunting him about Winterfell, and just saying really vile things, threatening Sansa's life, basically just the usual Ramsay stuff. The big moment, though, comes from Daenerys and the Dothraki. Jorah and Dario find Vase Dothrak and end up finding Daenerys leaving a Khaleesi therapy circle. They make a plan to escape, which basically consists of Daenerys pushing bowls of fire around. Honestly, it's kind of comical how calm and easily she just pushes those bowls of fire around, and the Dothraki don't really do shit to stop it. But anyways, this ending scene is kind of cool and really nicely shot. This kind of eats. Yeah, this shot eats. It really does. This is a good shot. It looks amazing, but the plot itself is kind of ridiculous. In general, I struggle with this episode because a lot does happen, but most of it wasn't even very good. Obviously, John and Sansa's reunion was great, probably the best part of the episode. Theon and Yara are fantastic. King's Landing is mid, but dear God, if I have to endure through one more marine scene, I think I might lose my shit. Episode four, Book of the Stranger. I there are some great moments, just as there are bad moments. So it'll it's another meh for me. It's another brand of Three-Eyed Raven. The ending of the door is absolutely incredible. Arguably, Hodor's demise and death is a top 10 moment throughout the entire series for me. So it's beyond tragic that the rest of the episode is a major snooze fest with shit writing. Arya's Bravos plot is interesting here. She's getting a bit better at combat and is given another job from Jock and Hagar to assassinate an actress. Then we get like five minutes of the play, which adds literally nothing to the story. Sue me, but it's kind of entertaining. Oh, I am a 
about to go! I don't know why they're showing us this entire thing. After a dick shot jump scare, it appears that Arya is growing rather interested and fond of the actress, and she's getting a bit hesitant on murdering her. Yeah, that's really where the shit ends. House Greyjoy begins voting for a new ruler, and it's so f good at first, with Yara stepping up to promote her claim to the Pike throne, and Theon having such a great character arc moment where he fully backs his sister's claim, and it's just so good. Much like most of the season though, good things do not last forever. Year on Greyjoy pops up, makes three cock jokes within the span of a minute and a half, makes an absolutely ridiculous claim to rule, even admits to murdering Balon Greyjoy, and he somehow still gets the f crown. Boring, yawning, sloppy, lazy. I know Yara was always at a disadvantage for being a woman, but come on now. In any other season, Euron would not have gotten away with any of his bullshit. The final scene is great though, with Euron's coronation and the overlapping of Theon and Yara escaping Pike. I'm not even talking about Maureen here, but Varys facing off with the High Priestess and him being completely shook is pretty okay. Jorah shows Daenerys his grayscale. It's a pretty fantastic fantastic moment and very beautifully shot might I add. Just a lot of emotion. Danny forgives Jorah and orders him to find a cure. I liked it. Castle Black is okay here. Sansa meets up with Littlefinger and she completely rips into him. She also rejects Littlefinger's offer though of the Knights of the Veil, vale, which isn't super duper smart, but I can understand why she wouldn't want to trust Littlefinger off the bat. Plans to recruit other northern houses to ally behind Jon and Sansa begins, and Brienne is sent to River Run, which has been taken back by the Tullys, to encourage the Blackfish to provide Sansa with men. The highlight surprisingly comes from Bran, believe it or not. This shit was pretty fantastic. We find out some pretty vital information about the Night King. The children were the ones who created him in the first place to protect them from the first men who who invaded Westeros. Then Bran f***s up by working on his own and bumping into the whole ass White Walker army and the Night King, and it's a big fat yikes for him. Uh, uh, oh, f*** me! Oh, God! With the Night King imprinting on Bran, him, Mira, and Hodor got to get the hell out of that tree, but not before Bran and the Three-Eyed Raven randomly see the young Starks and young Hodor one last time. The sequence of the children, Mira, Hodor, and even Summer all fighting against the psychotic army of the dead is just wild. Mira kills a White Walker, which is awesome. Summer dies and Bran wargs into Hodor, which brings us to the moment you've all been waiting for. Oh, Hodor. Oh. Oh, this is so sad. Wait. Oh. Okay, this is actually one of the most depressing deaths of the series. Poor Hodor got f***ed up and then died protecting the same person who screwed him over in the first place. It's just so sad, like damn. This is a pretty major gag though, because at the end of the day, this also officially confirms that time travel is a thing. Overall, truly a phenomenal ending to the episode. This one is a tough one to rank because the fantastic ending really outweighs the mediocrity of the rest of the episode, but it also feels wrong putting so much emphasis on just one final moment when the entire episode was pretty bland for the most part. The door. If the entire episode was just the Bran and Hodor moments, I would put this a lot higher, but I can only give it Bran the Three-Eyed Raven here, and it'll go behind the children. Oh, <sighs> 
So, Blood of My Blood was really just a complete snooze fest. For me, the one redeeming quality of this episode was Sam and Gillian Hornhill. While his mother and sister are absolutely lovely to him and Gilly, his father is just an absolute major asshole, specifically to Sam. I need to give the actor some props. He does a very good job of making us completely despise him off the bat. I thought the Night's Watch might make a man of you. Managed to stay soft and fat. Well, damn. Calm the f*** down, Gramps. Shortly after, Sam decides to take Gilly and baby Sam with him to the Citadel since his dad is a massive dickwad. And it's an equally fantastic moment, especially when he takes the family sword for himself. By the way, seeing the Reach for the first time was such a treat. The brand subplot is just ridiculous. Oh my god, the brand subplot is just ridiculous. Benjamin Stark makes a comeback though, just to move the f***ing plot along. Go f*** yourself. <laughs> This could have been good, but it's so glaringly obvious that he's solely there just to carry the plot on. It's just such lazy writing. I'm getting really bored too of the war on religion in King's Landing. It's definitely dragged on much longer than it needed to. Marjorie becomes religious or appears to be doing so, which leads to an underwhelming climax of this whole religion versus the crown shit. When it turns out Marjorie has influenced Tommen to ally with the High Sparrow and reunite the faith in the crown. Mace Tyrell was definitely the highlight here though. Jamie then also gets sent to River Run and demoted from his position as head of the King's Guard. Walder Frey, he's back and he unveils Edmure Tully. Oh my god, it's so cheesy. More play scenes are back and are unironically the best part of the episode. Arya bonds with the actress. She's supposed to kill and ends up saving her. The apprentice woman was watching the whole time though and now Arya is the real one in deep shit so she takes Needle and f***s off. The ending is so corny too with Daenerys making a speech about taking over Westeros once again. She makes all the Kalasar her blood riders which was actually a pretty good moment. Not much else to say about Blood of My Blood. It was all just pretty boring to be honest. I did not like Blood of My blood. It was tolerable enough to save it from your McQueen though, so it'll go behind the Dance of Dragons. The Broken Man was actually kind of good. Things kick off with a cold open for the first time in a while, which I really enjoyed, especially since Sandor is back. <laughs> God, I'm so excited. I am. He's currently hanging with some really nice religious hippie people who are building some type of tower, and while it doesn't entirely add anything to the overall story, it does bring back Sandor Clegane, and it was a very lovely few moments overall. Boring religious talk is boring religious talk. However, I did catch that the High Sparrow subtly threatens Elena's safety to Marjorie, which promptly forces Marjorie to to tell her to leave King's Landing as subtly as possible. It is a great scene, probably one of the best Marjorie moments in a while we've gotten. Cersei meets up with Elena to try and encourage her to stay in King's Landing to fight the faith with her one last time, but Elena drags her pretty, pretty horrendously, I might say. We need each other. I wonder if you're the worst person I've ever met, but the truly vile do stand out through the years. I mean, yeah. <laughs> Elena really has been the knight in shining armor these past two seasons. I will also say seeing Cersei still having a fire in her at this point is pretty great as well. Jon, Sansa, and Ser Davos are looking for houses in the north to join their army before they march onto Winterfell. The wildlings declare their loyalty and agree to fight for them, which is a great moment. And then we go to House Mormont and Bella Ramsey. Oh my god, shit just got so good. 
In short, Liana is a badass 10 year old and is incredibly stern, sassy, aggressive, and of course, the head of House Mormont. After Davos goes on his little motivational tangents, Liana Mormont backs up the cause and sends only 62 men to fight with them, but you know what? Good enough. The rest of the Northern Houses reject them though, and John is forced to go to Winterfell, being horribly outnumbered compared to the Boltons. Sansa writes a letter, and then that's where everything ends. Jamie at River Run is fine. It's a bit slow at some parts, but undoubtedly the standout is Jamie's conversation with the Blackfish in an attempt to get him to surrender. Technically, this scene could have been avoided since he was never going to surrender in the first place. Also, River Run looks fantastic here, by the way. Another moment that doesn't have a lot of reason to exist is Yara and Theon in Volantis. They do have a great moment together where Yara encourages Theon to find his inner strength and shit, and it's pretty good. Arya in Bravos is really the only major downside for me here. She finds a way out of Bravos, and then she literally gets horribly and violently stabbed in the abdomen like three f***ing times, falls into a dirty-ass river, and somehow still makes it out relatively unharmed and alive. No. No, that is the nastiest ass water ever. You're dead. Yeah, so that's just bullshit. And God, is the writing so bad here. The ending is pretty dark and depressing. Members of the Brotherhood stumble upon the Happy Hippie Committee, trying to threaten them for food and supplies. And then they come back again later and completely massacre the entire committee apart from Sandor, who is very visibly shook and angry. And it's a pretty great yet devastating ending, I'll say. So yeah, the broken man was pretty good. I like that the broken man refers to either Sandor or Theon here. Sure had some questionable moments, but as a whole, I actually thoroughly enjoyed the episode, especially the reintroduction of Sandor, Liana Mormont, and then Elena with Marjorie and Cersei as well. I actually enjoyed the broken man. I love seeing Sandor back and it was enjoyable. It'll go in Ned's honor. It's gonna go right behind Misa. No One is a pretty average as average can get episode with a lot of mediocrity, but also a lot that I very openly dislike. So maybe it teeters more on bad than it does average. Sandor gets revenge on some members of the Brotherhood who murdered all of his hippie friends, which was pretty good. F you. Those are your last words. F you. Come on, you can do better. God, I love him. He also ends up running into the Good Brotherhood, which was a nice and fun surprise. And they all just end up bonding over the murder of pretty bad people. Sandor joins the Brotherhood and that's it with that. Maureen will annoy the f out of me if I talk about it for too long here. So here we go. Varys goes on a mysterious mission. Tyrion's plans to make peace with the masters ended up being incredibly f***ing stupid all along. Are we surprised? Because now they they're attacking Marine. Daenerys is back, and the one redeeming quality here is seeing Masande laugh. But anyways, f Marine. Cersei and King's Landing is actually pretty good for the most part. Order your man to step aside, or there will be violence. I choose violence. You're damn right you choose violence. Nothing necessarily comes out from these scenes, but I just love seeing Cersei slowly come back to her power position and diabolical ways. Tommen gets rid of trial by combat though, and she's kind of back to square one. That is until a mysterious rumor is discussed between Kyburn and Cersei. Riverrun meets probably one of the most underwhelming, rushed, and frustrating ending of any season six subplot by far. Brienne and Podrick meet up with Bronn and Jamie. Bronn grabs Pod's junk and Brienne and Jamie have an all right moment together actually. The best moment is undoubtedly the highly tension filled talk between Jamie and Edmure. Jamie is just at his absolute worst here. Threatening Edmure and his baby and just being all around absolutely ruthless really brings me back to season one and to Jamie. 
time. Somehow Jamie was influential enough to make Edmure a complete f***ing mindless robot and orders his men to let the phrase and Lannister siege River Run. And that's it. That's the Siege of River Run. Then to add more insult to injury, the Blackfish has a horrendously uneventful death off screen. My god, did they fumble this ball hard. Arya's final scenes in Bravos are the most cartoon-like, oopsie-poopsie, lazily constructed moments of this show. Actress Lady takes in Arya and turns out she's conveniently an unregistered nurse and helps Arya heal. Then the next morning she dies. And the most ridiculous chase scene that came straight out of GTA occurs. To top it all off, the final few moments sees an epic fight between Arya and apprentice villain girl off screen. And then Arya officially leaves the faceless man and heads back to Winterfell. A girl is Arya Stark of Winterfell and I'm going home. Oh, thank God. That really is the greatest silver lining here. At least we won't have to deal with the faceless men anymore. But yeah, no one was a pretty uninspired hodgepodge of an episode. I hated no one. <laughs> it's not bad enough to be Yoma Queen status. It's shame, shame, shame for me. The Battle of the Bastards. As you can see, I'm rocking the Jon Snow going into battle hairdo. So here's the thing with this one. The writing and most of the stories told are admittedly not very good. There's a plethora of plot armor, inconsistencies, rushed moments, and obvious plot devices used to slowly move the story along and nothing else. But I will be damned if this is is one of the most beautifully shot, most entertaining, satisfying episode in the show's entirety. Dude, come on now. Come on now, this is the shot. This is the shot. Yeah. I actually tend to forget Daenerys and Marine was involved in this episode, primarily because the liberation of Marine from the Masters, all of it is just so incredibly rushed here. I know the big shining moment is supposed to be the actual battle of the Bastards, but still, all this mess just for the liberation to take a total of like 10 minutes. Then there's also Yara and Theon's proposal of an alliance with Daenerys, and for some reason, Tyrion is just a complete an absolute dickwad to Theon. He's just so dislikable here. I have to say, just the fact that half of the Greyjoys and single Targaryen coming together is pretty f***ing awesome. Obviously, though, the subplots in Winterfell take center stage here. With the Battle of the Bastards, there's a quick meeting between Sansa, Jon, and Ramsay, and Ramsay is just deliciously evil here. This was a pretty good meeting though, if not a bit unnecessary, however. Sansa and Jon argue once again, and it's really f***ing annoying and unnecessary considering the fact that it's about not having enough men. Even though Sansa literally has the Knights of the Vale in her back pocket right now. That was the reason why she was writing that letter back in episode 7. Anyways, Jon asking Melisandre to not bring him back to life if he dies again is pretty great. Davos and Tormund bonding is fantastic, and Davos fighting Shireen's stag toy is just f***ing phenomenal and chilling. And then that shot with Davos in front of the sunrise, chef's f***ing kiss. Mwah. Ooh, bitch. Oh, no. Then the battle begins, and I just gotta give credit where credit is due, because the budget. Not a single penny went to waste here. Truly everything looks phenomenal. Simply breathtaking, I could go on and on. The writing, on the other hand, is pretty laughable from time to time. Rickon is used solely as a plot device to get Jon to leave his post and f*** up his entire army strategy. We do get that magnificent shot, though. I can't entirely complain about that. Speaking of Jon, he's literally invincible here. They abused the hell out of his plot armor for sure, and it's actually ridiculous at times. He straight up should have died. But like I said, though, 
the choreography, the cinematography here is just god tier. There's so much controlled chaos and it legitimately looks like a full-on battle. Shit gets ridiculous again though because conveniently there's a wall of dead bodies that have been built in just one single place. When the Boltons start enclosing on the army and all hope is lost, that's really the best part of the episode for me. Just the chaos, the claustrophobia really translates through the screen. The giant doing his thing is great. Tormund biting off someone's ear is simply iconic. And then there's the plot twist of Sansa, Littlefinger, and the veil saving the day. Listen, listen. It's lacking in the good writing, but I've gotta admit, this is still a serve and a half. Here's the thing, like this moment has so much potential. It makes no sense to hide. It's such a big thing, you know? Obviously, Sansa should have said something. Here's kind of the way I feel like they could fix this. The conversation between Sansa and Littlefinger should have happened in episode eight instead of earlier on. Sansa should not have appeared in this episode until the veil came in, essentially. Just add more attention to whether she got the veil or not. Moving on from that though, the fall of the Boltons is fantastic. Oh my god, oh my god, isn't that so good? Oh my god. The giant dies while breaking Jon's army into Winterfell. Jon versus Ramsay and Jon beating the hell out of Ramsay is very satisfying. Even the ending where Sansa kills off Ramsay officially is very satisfying as well. And I personally am glad to see Sansa get her moment of justice. So I know that Battle of the Bastards is a lot of people's ultimate fave. And honestly, I can totally see both arguments here. There is a lot to love with this episode. Primarily with the action, the satisfying end to the Boltons. It's all very entertaining and all very enjoyable and satisfying to watch. However, this being a season six episode, it struggles greatly with the writing, the plots, and the pacing. But because of the good this episode has to offer, I will decide to put those negative factors aside. Battle of the Bastards. I just can't help it. I've got to put it in Ned's honor. You know what I'm gonna do tomorrow? I'm gonna sit down and watch every death scene. Literally, so should. I'm gonna skip the entire show and just watch all the death scenes. <laughs> watch all the death scenes. That's kind of all you need, though. Can you hear the music? Yep. It adds to the vibe. Ew, this scene's really gross. Oh no! Show, yeah, and they show the entire oh. thing. Oh my god! <laughs> I know! It appears the Queen Mother doesn't wish to attend her own trial. Cersei? Yeah. Go to the Red Keep and show her the way. Tell me she's supposed to be on trial, but she just said, no, nah, I'm not going. Pretty much, yeah. Damn. <laughs> Damn, these kids know how to fight. Are they patiently waiting? What is that green stuff? She's like, fat. We cannot escape the justice of the gods. Forget about the bloody gods and listen to what I'm telling you. <laughs> so, so you all need to I leave mean, now. Oh my yeah. god. So they're not letting it win. Yeah. Oh, oh it's gonna blow. It's gonna blow. <laughs> oh my god. Oh my god. Oh my god. It's green fire. Oh no. Oh no. Oh, no. oh yeah. Yeah. I didn't know we were going to see Oppenheimer. I f***ing love the winds of winter and I will not apologize for that. The first 20 minutes or so made Cersei one of, if not my favorite character throughout the show. I mean, the Sept of Baylor explosion. Need I say more? Every Cersei scene here in general is just electric, including her coronation, which is pretty controversial for some people, but I personally thought it was just so haunting and the way she looks at Jamie, she is the Mad Queen. Tommen's death 
death is just so breathtakingly haunting yet gorgeous to look at. Everything in King's Landing, for the most part, is perfect here. Everything else in this episode is pretty alright. I did feel like it slowed down a bit after the explosion. It definitely didn't match up to the same acceleration, but it was still solid enough for me. Sam arrives at the Citadel for his maester training. Jamie hangs with Walder Frey. That girl looks awfully suspicious. Elena allies with Alaria Sand, and it's always a gift seeing Elena roast characters I hate. Daenerys prepares to leave for Westeros, even ditching Dario, which was such a random choice. I get she doesn't want to have any side hose, but completely ditching Dario, who is pretty useful to you, is just such a strange, spontaneous choice. But then Daenerys naming Tyrion as Hand of the Queen is so f***ing good. The North is also very good. Davos raging at Melisandre over Shireen will never fail to get me emotional. And then Jon showing off his ability to rule right afterwards by being merciful yet stern by banning Melisandre from the North forever is a nice little detail. Then we get Bran's revealing blast to the past moment where Jon is revealed as Aegon and Targaryen, which at the time was wild. <laughs> <gasps> That's Jon Snow, the baby he was holding. Oh! He's a Targaryen God. and a Sark. That's crazy. Then there's Jon Snow's meeting and coronation, whatever you want to call it. The king of the north. The king of the north. The king of the north. I do really love the juxtaposition between this coronation versus Cersei's, by the way. Arya also uses her new skills as no one and murders Walder Frey and bakes his own son into a pie. It's a bit cartoonish and silly, but you can't deny this was such an incredibly satisfying moment. Everything wraps up with the end and... Oh, oh. Oh my god. Ignoring the fact that Varys somehow f***ing teleported from Dorne to the east, this is such a powerful moment. And then the exhilaration of seeing Daenerys' fleet and her dragons, it really hypes you up for what's coming next. Oh, yeah, this is good. I want to shake my ass so hard right now. Go to jail. And it's over. That was a wild ride. That was a good episode, though. The Winds of Winter has a few flaws. It wouldn't be a season six episode without them. But overall, this is one of, if not the most satisfying, entertaining, mesmerizing season finales we've gotten across all six seasons. I could go on and on gushing about the opening, pee myself over the ending, and screech like a banshee at John's reveal as a Targaryen. It's a fantastic and promising ending. Last but not least, we have the Winds of Winter. I may gag you all, but I'm putting it at the end of the top tier. Great way to end this video where a lot of the episodes here did not rank super high. So it's nice that at the very least I got one episode in the top tier. The trajectory of my life has been changed the minute Cersei blew up that sept. Oh. Jude is the reason why I'm putting this so high up. Another season really captures the essence of the good, the bad, and the mediocre quite like season 6. Here is my thing. I do believe that overall season 6 is a pretty good season, but not for the same reasons that seasons 1 through 4 are great seasons. I feel like a lot of the shock and high quality we get from season 6 comes from the actions and big budget shock value moments and relies less on dialogue. Which is not a bad thing per se. The only examples I can really give is everything in the Battle of the Bastards and the Winds of Winter. And I guess the final moments of the door as well. These are some of the biggest and most memorable moments, not only in the season, but throughout the show as well. The dialogue is not there, but that does not take away from the magnificence of all these moments. Having said that, <laughs> 
when this show does attempt to give us some good dialogue, they don't. I definitely believe without George R.R. R. Martin and the rest of his series being incomplete at this point, this show was basically doomed with its dialogue. David and D.B. really struggle here. I won't really go over what I dislike specifically about season 6 because for the most part I've made that all pretty clear, but I will say nothing beats the deterioration deterioration of Arya's and Tyrion's characters here. They arguably suffer the worst from bad dialogue this season and it's truly tragic to watch. A lot of people say that they don't like Jon Snow in season 6, but I liked him. Yeah, that's my overall final thoughts on season 6. I do think it's still a much better season than season 5. I also love that the budget has been raised a lot here so we get some really nice quality visuals, but trust me. It's gonna get a lot worse. <laughs> so yeah, this is the updated tier list. Just two more seasons to go and then this is over. But for now, here are all of the episode rankings. This ranking was an interesting one. <laughs> Seasons 5 and 6 definitely are the two most mixed seasons in terms of quality. The whiplash I'd get from watching a pretty good episode and then promptly being forced to watch a girl talk about bad pussy. Dude, it was a lot to handle. One thing that most, if not all, fans can agree on is that the lack of George R.R. R. Martin influence in the writing is not good. <laughs> Compared to what we're about to go into with seasons 7 and 8, these two seasons are pretty tame. Were there a lot of choices made with these two seasons that I thoroughly did not enjoy and completely hated altogether? Absolutely. Were there moments that I did love though? Absolutely. I think one thing's for sure, this is not the same show that seasons one through four was. Season five was a fine season, if not a bit confused and lost in its own plots and direction and pretty boring and unmemorable overall. Obviously hard home is the standout for me. Mother's Mercy and the Walk of Atonement is great as well. Season 6 was more of a major mixed bag compared to season 5. It either had incredible highs or just rock bottom lows. The greats being the final two episodes really with the sept explosion, the retaking of Winterfell from the Boltons. The dialogue is worse than season 5 but I think that the overall story and direction with season 6 is much more grounded and sure of itself. Yeah, that's all I have to say on that. said all I wanted to say, I'm pretty sure. One more part to this series and then it's over. I just want you all to know though, this has been so much fun to make. I love Game of Thrones and I hope that shows. It's been a great journey to go through Game of Thrones with all of you. Whatever happens, I am so ready to just tackle these last two seasons, this final part with all of you. Hopefully you're all still here by the time I post this video. I just want to say thank you all so much for watching again. Yeah, I will see you all in the finale. Bye.